Okay, so for this is um, chapter seven, and it's for micrometer instruments. So micrometers, um, they are one of the most accurate of hand tools. Okay, we call them hand tools, and they definitely obey Abe's law. And the line of measurement is in line with the axis of the measurement for micrometers. And they fall into the category of calibers in the two opposing ends joined by a frame. So therefore, it is referred to as micrometer calibers or mics. So we make the micrometer by using rotational screw as the element that limits discrimination. So all micrometers are based on the relation of a screw, circular movement to its axial movement. So here is your circular movement, and it is in relation to its axial movement. So each turn of the screw would move it a distance that could be measured with a steel rule. So here, this is your steel rule. And it's pretty unique because every turn is giving you the distance. So the amplification is the ratio of circumference to lateral movement. There is your circumference to the lateral movement. So the amount of amplification increases with the increase of the circumference and a decrease in the screw thread. So the lateral travel of the screw is in one revolution. So the greater the ratio between the circumference and the lead of the screw, the higher the possible amplification. Okay, so to make a screw and a nut into a micrometer measurement instrument, it's definitely necessary to extend the nut to form a reference point. So here, that's your reference point, and here is your measure point. And this is our circumferential scale, and here is your lateral movement scale. So the screw furnishes the measure point, and this setup creates the frame of the basic micrometer. So in order to make a screw and a nut into a measurement instrument, you've got to extend the nut to form a reference point, okay? So this creates the frame of the basic micrometer. And you're going to see here, see, look at this, there's your frame. So micrometer readings, the functional parts on this side. And this side is your metrological features. So here is your reg reg stop. And this is your head of your micrometer. So from here to here, you can see this is your thimble that you can rotate. And here is your thimble scale. And this is your barrel. And you will see your barrel scale right there. And this is your clamp ring, your spindle. And here is your anvil. And then the frame, OK? And you can be able to see the opening where you're going to put your parts to be measured. And this side is your metrological features. And here you will see uh, the axis right here is your line of measurement. And this is your reference point at the end though. And here is your measured point, And that's your distant end of observation. And here is your observed value. So screw limb is a standard built into the instrument. Okay, you can see that. So the functional features make the metrological ones usable for practical measurement. So you put your parts right here to be measured. The reliability of micrometer is its readability. Okay, and it's easier to read in micrometer than it is in the vernier because micrometer graduations, they're definitely wider. So that readability and discrimination is the power of your micrometer. Okay, here are the scale, the discrimination, and one by 64. 
inches in the finest division is 0 0.015 inches wide, 0 0.020 inches on a decimal inch scale. Okay. Very near the discrimination goes to 0 0.001 inches, and that's a coincident setting. Micrometer, when you look at it, you're going to see the discrimination is 0 0.001 inches. And that's your finest division and go to 0 0.060 inches wide. Okay, and see like how you can be able to easily read it. And here in scale is pretty difficult because they're all pretty much confused to each other. And then here Bernie a little bit better than the scale. Okay, but micrometer is good and you know, for reading. So um. Reliability again, it's on readability. So the smallest division on the micrometer reads to 0 0.001, but it's four times, okay, as wide as 1 by 64 inches in scale. So although the micrometer and vernier have the same discrimination, the micrometer is most readable because of the way, okay, it is designed. Micrometer reading is um, when you look at the micrometer, it is read by simply totaling the number, okay, of whole division and then the barrel scale and adding the thousand from the thimble scale. So you have only two. One is a barrel that's for your whole division, and then here is your thimble, and that's your thimble scale. So the reading is just totaling both of that, okay. So when you take a look at the hill, you're going to see your inches in barrel scale, pretty large here, and you go from 0 to 1, 2, so and so. The thimble is going to rotate every time it rotates out, you're going to see the barrel scale increases. And large division is 0 0.100 inch for each of your graduation, and small division is 0 0.025 inches for each of your graduation. And thimble scale is 0.0. 0, 0.01 divisions, okay, from 0 0.000 to 0 0.025. Um, you have to take a look at it in the lab. So a micrometer is read by simply, like I said, totaling the number of whole divisions on the barrel scale and adding the thousand, okay, from the thimble scale. But you have to be careful if the frame, okay, is larger than one inch. A fourth step is necessary, that of adding the frame size to the total. But we suddenly do it. So when you look at here, the metric at each division, one by two millimeter or one revolution, stagger one millimeter division right there, space half millimeter or one revolution. And here it's pretty difficult to take a look at it, but when you measure it by using micrometer in the lab, you will you will get a hold of it. Okay. So don't worry about the reading right here. Um, it's all right. So micrometer reading step one, the highest figure on the barrel that is uncovered by the thimble. Okay, and then that's the 100, again, millimeter part of the reading. And that is the 100 millimeter part of the reading. This is, I think, repeated, so I just delete that. What is just telling you, step one is go ahead and read the barrel scale, okay? Um, that's definitely not covered by a thimble, because every time you rotate the thimble, you're going to see uh, the barrel scale. So read that first. And step two, you're going to note the whole number of the graduation between the figure and the thimble. So it may be 5, 10, or 15, and each of these represent, again, 5 millimeter. So the division between are normally 0 0.5 millimeter or 1 revolution. And step three, read the thimble opposite the index of the barrel. So read that means I read the thimble scale, okay? And this is going to give you 0 0.01 millimeter reading. And that's from 0 0.00 to 0 0.49 inch. So that's on your example. 0 and 0, 0 0.50 inch on the thimble, they coincide. The zero position is nothing but when passing the zero position right there, on the thimble, so right here on the thimble, so there is a chance error to read an extra 0 0.50 millimeter. That's 0 0.025 an in inch. 
So one of the few errors that can happen when passing that zero on the thimble, okay, is that you're gonna read it um, extra 0 0.5 millimeter. So in order to reduce our thimble zero mark error and observation error micrometers, okay, they are made in slanting graduation. So that way you will not make the observational error. So the slanting graduations, they're on the barrel of the micrometer and that's going to reduce the chances of your observational errors. So this table is showing you your micrometer advantages and disadvantages. Um, you should read it to know what they are. So on advantages, they're more accurate than the rules. Everybody knows that. Also, better precision than your calipers. Better readability than your rules or verniers. And you won't get parallax error, okay? Because you don't have to do alignment at all with your eyes. And also small, portable, and easy to handle. And they're kind of not very expensive. And they also retain accuracy better than the vernier. That's the same thing here. And has wear adjustment. Okay, that's all instrument have wear adjustment. And they also have end measurement. So for disadvantages, for micrometers are the short measuring range. Okay, can do a very uh, long length to measure, and also single purpose instrument. And you can do only end measurement. Sorry, that just my phone. Okay. Anyway, so the disadvantage is a single purpose instrument and also end the measurement, end measurement only. Another disadvantage is you have the limited wear area, uh, the little anvil, remember, and the spindle tip. Okay, so that's not very good for, uh, for us instrument. The end measurement right here and the end measurement only right here. Um, that's because for this side, for advantage, is only for screw, okay? The anvil and spindle tip wear remain uh, definitely a potential source of error. So don't uh, make a mistake around this two thing. So end measurement is an advantage where it can be used, but it's also an, a disadvantage Disadvantage to have, a, to have an instrument that can only be used for end measurement, okay? The micrometer accuracy, precision, and discrimination. So in terms of measurement instrument and micrometer accuracy is a relation between the reading, so that's your observed values, and the true values. Precision is the fitness of the instrument of the dispersion or repeated readings. Okay? Again, precision, remember repeated accuracy it's always with your standard so that was you always seeing a comparison between the reading and the true values discrimination again is the smallest readable division discrimination graduations are nothing but your little, little divisions right here so here discrimination is related to instrument precision okay so accuracy always a ratio and here is your error um, that can happen, the observational error. Your true value is always in relation with your accuracy of reading. Your precision, again, is the fitness of your instrument. And then your discrimination is the smallest readable division. When you look at the construction of your micrometer, you're going to see some parts. So the parts of an outside micrometer consists of number one, here is your frame, and then your little anvil right there, and then your spindle that can be rotated. And the optional lock, okay, some of the micrometer, they come with it. And then your thimble, you can rotate it. 
to change the uh, barrel scale, okay? And then the Steve or the barrel is right here. And then the optional, your ratchet stop. You can stop your measurement. So frames, so there are many different constructed frames in micrometers. So full finished solid frame, they're popular for 25, 50, 75, 100 millimeter sizes of micrometers, okay? And drop fork frame is both plated and black finished. It's kind of look good, you know? And then the tubular frame is light weighted with heat conduction characteristics. Anvil, so the anvil part is hardened, it replaceable definitely with wear adjustment in older motors or interchangeable and screwed into the frame. Okay, I like this. So wear adjustment in older motors are overcome by carbide. That's just an element from your periodic table. Carbide anvil is better for precision and accuracy and carbide spindles. Your barrel and your thimble. So the barrel is fastened to the frame. You can see it just right there. And it contains both the barrel graduations and the nut in which the screw turns. Okay. And the thimble is again attached to your screw and carries a 0 0.01 millimeter. So that's a 0 0.001 inch scale. You know, zero setting is accomplished by losing the parts and resetting the thimble scale. So here you can clearly see the zero right there on this thimble. So this picture is just trying to tell you uh, how to measure. So first you carefully clean the surface by pulling a piece of soft paper between the surfaces while they are in light contact. With the paper, do not use the hard paper, so that's cleaning your spindle and your anvil. And then with the anvil and spindle apart, and lock the cap with spanner wrench, okay? Then here, unlock it, and then tighten the cap lightly with fingers to bring slight tension between the thimble and the spindle. Okay, you're just trying to um, feel that whole contact, and then adjust with this little uh, wrench, okay, of the cap. And then bring the anvil right here and the spindle together by turning the spindle and set zero line on thimble, okay, to coincide with the line on the barrel. So here you have your barrel right there and then you have your thimble scale right there and then you want to uh, make sure they coincide. So these lines coincide and set your zero. So this is just showing you how to zero set in the micrometer. So make sure to grip the micrometer like that and then move the spindle away from the anvil by turning the spindle not by turning the thimble you're going to turn right here with the spindle and then holding that thimble only tighten the cap with your fingers and be very careful not to touch the frame and then lock the cap okay with wrench this little one and then still hold that thimble at the time and adjustment now is completed Vernier micrometers. The principle of measurement for vernier micrometers is the same as for the vernier caliber. Okay, it's a form of amplification. So the vernier scale is on a barrel consisting of 11 equally spaced lines. So the first 10 are number 0 to 9. So here we are seeing the same picture again. And the discrimination is related to the instrument precision and it should be related to your accuracy. Okay. So here just trying to show you um, how to read your vernier micrometers. So steps for reading. So the last one is marked with a zero, second zero. So here your zero, and you have four steps to read it. So the very first one, the first significant figure, large barrel divisions. So you look at the, your barrel division first, and First significant figure is the one right here. And the second significant is right there. 
and thus from your small barrel division. So the large barrel division is going with 0.11, and the small barrel division is going 0.025. And the third significant figure is your thimble division is going with 0.001. It's straight there. Okay. So number four is your fold significant figure. The number of vernier line that's in coincide coincidence with a thimble line. So this is your fold significant figure. So here in our case we get four and then five and then we have one nine. So therefore five becomes six and then we have nine and then the last one is your seven. Okay. So reading the vernier micrometer, uh, you have much in common with reading the vernier height gauges and calibers okay including the need for practice so here it's pretty uh, clear to see the units okay digital micrometers is the same as your digital verniers so when you look at the digits it's easier to read the smallest the graduation so the micrometer has a digital this readout okay you can convert that from inches to Millimeter, just press on it and it's going to show you millimeter. If you press a different uh, unit, it's going to also show you the inches. So it's very convenient to use the digital micrometers. So it's just nothing but it's just a uh, electronic amplification. Okay. So here, that's your digital readout. So why do we need to stick it in uh, to the micrometer just to make sure that you get on? Uh, you can read it easily okay to simplify the reading sometimes you can connect okay your digital micrometer to a data printer so this is your data printer so you're connecting with an adapter so another electronic version right there micrometer and you are putting the micrometer on a holder and connect it to a data printer so you can easily print out the measurement so that's pretty unique. So digital micrometers can be able to do that, okay? So that's the stand, and then that's your electronic printout. Cool and proof. Cool and proof are good, and your care must be taken for micrometers for being damaged by dirt or oil. So cool and proof micrometers are they're designed for environments, so where you know oil or fluids are often used. Here is an old model of micrometer. So nearly three quarters of a century ago, so this guy, Carl John Hansen, you know, he uh, developed gauge block set combination, and in chapter eight, uh, you're gonna uh, learn about him, and modified the micrometer to give better control. So he did not use it to measure gauge blocks, as he often been stated, but gauge blocks are used to measure micrometers. Okay, so. He used the gauge block to measure the micrometers, but not micrometers to measure the gauge block. So he used it to control the manufacturing operation up to the uh, final sizing. So this guy is the guy who actually developed the gauge blocks. Okay? So in every measurement, there is the part, and then the observer, and then the instrument of measurement. So we're now studying many different kinds of instruments of measurements. So added to this measurement system, environment in which the measurement is made is the next factor. So the control of the measurement is made by these factors. So here, control of measurement, so the total control increases as the requirement become more stringent. So the emphasis shifts from the user to the instrument maker, okay? How good the instrument designer design his instrument is your control of your measurement. So when you look at the plane rules here, you can measure to one by 60 foot with accuracy one by 60 foot inches and reliable for one by 30 to, okay, so that 32 inches. So when you look at the, the combination squares, you're gonna see the measure to one by 60 fold, accurate one by 60 fold, reliable to one by 60 fold. So it's a little bit better than your plain rules of verniers. Reliable all the way to 0 0.005 inches, measure to 0 0.001, and accurate to 0 0.001. Micrometers, when you look at it, reliability is still at 0 0.005, 
it's going to measure the 0 0.001 0 1 and accurate the 0 0.002, okay, inches. So this is just trying to show you part of the control of power condition, control of intent, instrument accuracy, which is your inherent instrument accuracy, and then the control of your observer, and that's just given. So when we think about the versatility, micrometer is completely inflexible and used. It only produces reliable measurements, okay, in the first four cases. So here, unfortunately, the condition shown by the next two here, okay, uh, often cannot be detected by the eyes when you take a look at it, what a micrometer makes. So these, the first four, so you have external points, external lines, and then external parallel planes and your combination of all of that. So here we're putting a part into each K okay, of this micrometer. And it's definitely inflexible to use. So this from here all the way to here for all of that part produces the reliable measurement. But this one, let's take a careful look at the parts. So here are internal points and lines. This one is definitely non-parallel long planes. See the plane is completely narrowing out to this site. And a combination of this. So when you measure objects like that, okay, definitely the reliability is low. Okay, so reliability between planes. So a micrometer is reliable for measurement between planes, but only when these planes are parallel and perpendicular to the axis of your micrometer. So when you look at it here, the geometry of your micrometer measurement, you're going to see right at the center line of measurement. So that's your axis of instrument. So here, when you look at it, we have 90 degree. 90 degree meaning it's perpendicular in both axes. And here is your measure plane, and here is your reference plane. And this is your micrometer, okay, your spindle, your anvil right there. So we put the part right there in order for us to be able to measure. And the reliability again between planes is definitely, okay, they have to be parallel. And they also have to be perpendicular to the axis of that micrometer. So the micrometer is a contact instrument. You definitely need to hold it. And uh, even if we have a holder for micrometer, okay, most of the time we hold and measure. So there are two mechanical types of control force features in micrometer. First one is your friction thimbles, and the second one is your ratchet stop. So the practice is definitely going to help you to judge the correct gauging force for reliable measurement. Okay, so your skill, how to uh, um, how to get the reliable measurement depends on your hands as well, how you control the device. Here's the torque in micrometers: the amount, okay, of twist and based on the principle of again lever in micrometers that's going back to our physics principles your foundation so here so both of these wrenches okay are applying the same torque to the screw so one pound per four feet your torque is 16 ounces per 48 inches your torque is one ounces per three inches okay so here the very first one is four foot your lever on and here you're going to have a one ounce per four foot torque applied to that screw and the next one right here so you have one pound force is applied to this lever and you get one pound per three inch torque applied to that screw okay so your lever on this time is three inches okay smaller lever the torque is nothing but you're seeing the force okay in a um, in a length so you can see here one pound per three inch. For pressure, you're seeing the force in the area. For top, you're looking at the force in a distance or a length. 
but when torque is applied to rotation in micrometers, force results. Okay. Again, torque is nothing but your force and distance or length. So when that is applied to the rotation in a micrometer, rotation in micrometer is nothing but your distance or the length. So you got your force. It's kind of like going backwards. Yeah. You know? In mathematical expression is you're doing your algebra on your paper. So in micrometer, it is the force that develops the field of that contact. So thus micrometers are called the contact instrument. Okay. So you are feeling the contact with a force that develops in that micrometer. So the amount that the spring in micrometer is compressed, and that depends on the thin vertical, okay, but it's limited by the ratchet stop. So you apply a force to the thimble, and the thimble goes a certain distance, and that's your graduation or discrimination that you're reading. So that is the distance. So your torque is nothing but that force, okay, and how much distance it goes. And the distance that it goes with that force is definitely showing in your instrument micrometer. And you can totally see the distance that goes on a barrel and a thimble, okay? And the torque is the feel that you're getting with your hand and the instrument contact. And we all have it because uh, everything that is physical in the whole world and in the multiverses is a mess. Okay, so uh, in physics we use little m. So every time that mass is interacting with something or going for a distance, uh, you get force. So mass, time, acceleration. Okay, mass, time, velocity. When you have it, then it goes into energy, kinetic energy. So when you measure the mass again with the gravity at a certain height, you get your potential energy. So it's all about uh, mass, okay, a, an amount of mass. And uh, if that's moving or not moving, when it starts to move, then we get all that properties of physics, okay, torque, force, momentum. And you have your pressure. And when you think about space, that's your area, and then, and then your distance, then you have all of this physics property coming along with that mass okay, movement or non-movement. So that's whatever we're doing in the world, whatever we're doing with our instrument and this metrology is based on that. Okay? So micrometer accessory, this little one, that's your ratchet stop. Okay, it's right here. So outside for the this one, I uh, take it out from the mid tutorial micrometers instrument that we're using in this textbook a lot. The so torque and the contact force right here. So you have your ratchet stop right there. Okay, 0 0.783 in this example length of the spring. So when compressed by a force of 12 and a half ounces created by half ounce per one inch tall right there okay the same thing for b and then c but just uh, changing readings right there so we're going down from 83 to 75 and then 75 this is the same but then you have one ounce and then here you have bigger force one pound okay The pressure in micrometer. All right. So after torque, torque is you're looking the force on a distance or length. Pressure, we're gonna look look the force on a particular area. So one force, force is nothing but your mass time acceleration. So meaning, an object is moving with a particular acceleration. Okay. And we are looking at the pressure meaning the force in a certain area. So in micrometer is the pressure of the contact point, okay, that in dance the surface against which it is applied. So here we're looking at a simple example of force and a pressure right there. So total force is your effective pressure. It's 180 pounds per 180 pounds, that's the 30 psi atmospheric pressure, 100 pounds, it's gonna give you 2000 psi. So when you take a look at it, it is the pressure, okay, of a contact point, not the force that indents the surface against which it is applied because we talk about the pressure when the force is on a particular area. So therefore, it isn't a force 
every time when there is an area we're talking about your pressure okay force is only uh, you're looking at the mass going with a certain acceleration okay not velocity but acceleration so anyway um so when micrometer is used the frame again is spread open and then the part is compressed when you're reading it because you've got to uh, adjust your anvil and the spindle and the part and the ratchet stop at the end okay of your um at the end of your handle is going to equalize that compression and micrometer frame expansion okay so this feature in micrometer is definitely useful So when you use a, this instrument micrometer, we can avoid the error. So a more reliable measurement instrument should be used for a dimension of four inches or larger in work in pro progress measurement. So if you want to do the work in progress measurement, you want to use the instrument that can do over four inches okay, or larger. So measuring the flat parts, it's better to slow down in measurement using micrometers to get the reliable data so you gotta go slow okay on uh, to put the part and then to measure it slowing down is the fastest way actually to measure the part reliable reliably okay so reliability will increase if you do your measurement uh, uh, step by step instead of going real fast so first here this is how your right hand is going to roll along the hand you can roll your instrument like that and then do not twirl like that it's wrong it's going to give you more errors so here you can see three steps first before placing the micrometer okay on the part right here that I'm trying to measure bring it to the approximate opening sites and place that micrometer on work hold the anvil against the reference plane and then rapidly close your micrometer until you cannot see between the spindle and the part okay then slow down then carefully close the spindle slowly close so using this little ratchet stop at the top onto the part until the ratchet stop releases just one click okay? and then you're going to stop so that's how you do to measure a part Sometimes we use a stand or you call it a holder um, so because we want to use our hands to, so in order for us to free a hand to handle the part we use these tool stands okay? it's just uh, holding your micrometer so sometimes you're going to get alignment error when you use your micrometer so for larger parts make sure you take care of the alignment again because misalignment can definitely indent your anvil into the part or sprain the frame okay so you definitely don't want to misalign the part in between the spindle and the anvil because it can hurt your frame so here's your line measurement and your excess of micrometer spindle is right there your anvil right here see how it is totally misaligned right here in this example that's really you know against your mechanical advantage so in order for you to have a mechanic advantage you've got to make sure your alignment is correct when you try to measure the small diameter that's your cylindrical parts okay the one that we're doing in the left uh, make sure the accurate measurement of cylinders require the line again of measurement be a diameter so for measuring smaller diameters alignment must be paid with extreme attention okay so here is your line of measurement you're going to gauge your pressure limits micrometer opening to the part diameter this is your micrometer anvil and your spindle and here is your axis which is your line of measurement only brute force could cause this type of misalignment so you can see it isn't aligned okay it's kind of like compressed right there you can see like how this cylinder is a little bit compressed at the top and the bottom the next one and here axis of micrometer line of measurement okay 
is right here. The line of measurement is completely off again, okay, from the axis. So this condition is going to produce the same field as in A, okay, but the measurement is going to be in a total jeopardy with a, a very big error right here. So right to start at the top of your uh, your micrometer is used for very small or very large diameters. Rocking over the center, again, here you're rocking over the center, required for the larger cylinder. When you measure a larger cylinder, then you need to rock your micrometer a little bit. Okay? For, smaller, uh, for smaller diameters, just use a ratchet stop. Rocking over center. Rocking over center, it's just a technique. Um, so here are the steps. And they're just for automatic for, uh, you know, automatically, uh, the the skilled metro metrologists, they automatically do this step, okay? You can read it and follow it, but then once you get them, you get them, okay? It's just like all diameter measurements with micrometers will result in minus error okay like i told you in the lab every reading usually give you the minus error and that's the reading is going to be less than the true diameter on the other hand plus error happens only when micrometer axis is not taken perpendicular that's 90 degree to the axis of your cylinder being measured so plus error can be you know can be um removed by centralizing so rocking over center technique, first you clean the micrometer and the part, rock across the cylinder to find the maximum opening. Okay, we, you, we are measuring the diameter, so therefore you have to try to find the maximum opening that is going to provide the desired feel. So that would be your diameter. And then rock along the axis very slightly to find the minimum okay, feel. Minimum feel is your center line zing uh, force, in which what Establish the micrometer at right angle to your axis. Step three may have removed all the feel from the step two, so therefore close the micrometer slightly and then repeat the step two and three. That just rock the center and then rock across the cylinder. And then when feel across the diameter is as desired, meaning you get to the center okay, of your uh, cylinder, and the perpendicularity is kind of okay, and take the reading and write that down. It's just trying to tell you to uh, move your uh, micrometer to the center of your cylinder by rocking over it, okay? So repeat all steps again at different diameters sufficient times to be satisfied with your measurement. So the more you measure, the more you will get it. This is just a summary of your external micrometer measurement for flat parts and your cylinder parts. So external micrometer measurement, um, the rules okay, for the reliable measurement, we cannot state it concisely, but then they're kind of like a general thing. Okay, for flat parts, you clean the contact surfaces of the part and of the micrometer. We all know you have to clean the instrument before you measure, but in the lab, you. You guys just go ahead and measure whatever. Okay, open slightly larger than part feature, then seat the end of squarely against the reference surface of part, and then use your ratchet stops, and then slowly close your micrometer until the ratchet clicks only once, and then record that reading. So you already know how to do this. Okay, I don't have to repeat it again and again. And then repeat the entire procedure several times and average your readings. So this is what we're trying to do. We measure a lot. And then we're going to average the reading at the end. The cylinder part is the same thing. You're going to clean your contact surfaces and then the instrument. And then you're going to open slightly larger than the part feature. Put the part in between that and then seat your angle squarely against the reference surface of your part. Rock again back and forth across your diameter to feel that center. Okay, Close the micrometer by small steps not to compress your frame. And then when first contact is felt, then rock sideways again to find the position over your center. 
of your cylinder. And now repeat the step four all the way to five until you get your perpendicular position, okay? And then adjust your uh, spindle contacts to the measure point as it passes over your center, okay? That's for your cylindrical core measurement. Okay, feel in the measurement. Influencing factors is size of the part. If the micrometer is very large, it will be on um, not very flexible. It, it might also be heavy. So the person using it must be more intent on support than on feel. Closely related to the first is the position of your measurement. Again, position matter when you're doing a measurement, even a 25 millimeter micrometer okay may provide inadequate feel if used at arm's length through a recess in a large machine i just trying to tell you to find the right position okay to hold your instrument and shape of the part again if the feel is checked against gauge blocks and then duplicate on a cylinder part of the same size then the reading would be 0.02 millimeter or more uh, don't go into a confusion in here uh, don't worry about too much either this gonna come from your skills and your measurement from the lip. So surface finish affects the feel. So a coarse finish is going to produce a more pronounced feel than a fine finish. Okay. But you don't really have to know the difference for this class. Um we're just laying the foundation for you in metrology. And if your job in the future you know needs it then you know how to do it. At least you get the basis. Alright so micrometer do's and don'ts clamp ring so do use it and you're going to use your clamp ring as a memory device to preserve a reading until repeated don't use it to make the micrometer into a snap gauge okay don't use a clamp ring um, uh, to make that micrometer into a snap gauge ratchet stop you're going to use it for every measurement between your flat surfaces and also don't expect it to uh, guarantee reliable measurement if your micrometer is dirty okay if you didn't clean it you won't get reliable measurement therefore i always say the lab measurements are all wrong because nobody is cleaning it even if i show you one time nobody is doing that so if your micrometer is dirty you won't get a reliable measurement if the micrometer is poorly lubricated we don't so all the errors in the lab is so erroneous the micrometer is poorly adjusted again we don't do calibration even the micrometer is closed too rapidly okay if you close the rear tight or rear hard then that's going to mess up your frame even if we can see with your naked eye that it is affecting your sensitive graduation and the barrel and the spindle scale right there okay so don't use it for measuring diameter unless they are very large or very small Machining. So micrometers are used definitely to check the machining of the part while it is still in the machine. You can stick your instrument right into your machine and measure wherever that is necessary. So micrometers are a very convenient tool to check work in process. And even if the machine is gone, you can still go ahead and do it to check it. Care of micrometers, you're going to clean it, disassemble, and then lubricate. So that is going to give you the best reliable instrument if you do that. If you don't, it's going to read something wrong. So never cramp, force, or over tighten your micrometer when aligning it on the parts. So over tightening error is usually caused by ignoring bias and carelessness. Okay? If you don't do any of it, then your micrometer is going to give you splendid reading. So inspection of micrometer. So when you inspect the micrometer, uh, what you're doing is actually calibrating it. So the micrometers in calibration, we compare it with the standards of known accuracy to determine its conditions, gauge blocks, optical flats. So they're used to calibrate micrometers because they provide the reliable means. Okay, zero satin again must be acquired by closing it with the same gauging pressure you use for measurement to improve your reliability. Otherwise, do manufacturers reset instructions it's always in your manual setting standards so standards we use it to check 
the calibration of the micrometers. So accurate masters, um, they, they're called the uh, satin standards and they're used for micrometer calibration. So gauge block is just a name, okay? So gauge blocks are also used in place for these standards. So if you don't have money, especially in you know, education, you know, um, academic at institution, then we use a gauge blocks as a standard, okay? Satin standards. All right, so micrometer standards, um, when you look at it here, so this is one inch diameter reference disk and here is your micrometer standard it's just a flat ends and here in this example size two inches all the way to five inches so here is your standard end measuring rods and that's the spirit how the spirit ends so you can see here a little spirit end right there so that's like a three inches to 23 inches they're just an example I want to show you the micrometer standards. So we use them again to check that calibration of your micrometer. So end surfaces of the standard end measuring rods are portions of your spear. Okay, and if flat parts here are, are being measured, the flat ended micrometer standard is preferred. So if you do the flats, okay, you're going to use this. Similarly, the spherical ends, okay, more nearly duplicate the feel of the measurements made again on your cylindrical parts. Gauge blocks, we use it in place of these standards, especially in a university environment. You know, we're going to get into the variations of micrometer. We have many special application micrometers. So here are some different types of micrometers screw thread micrometer looks like that we've got one i think two in the lab okay so screw thread micrometer this these example are from the uh, mid-tutorial american corporation this one is your disc micrometer okay again it's from the same company they have like a narrow disc for the context so see the anvil and the spindle ends are different because they're made with the disc micrometers because it's really good to uh, enter slots as narrow as one by 30 second inch and they're useful for measuring to one mil that's 0.001 inches sometimes you're going to see bigger and thicker in your discs and we use for measuring paper and other soft materials that require the large contact areas Blade. So here, this is your blade micrometer. So you can see, see, and the anvil and then the spindle ends are in blades, and they have like a 30 mil, 0.030 inch anvil and the spindle end, okay, to reach into a recess. So the spindle does not rotate. Blade micrometers are available in one mil again, 0.001 inch. So if I ask you what's one mil, you have to know 0.001 inch. Reading size is to six inches. So plate my, my micrometers require very careful handling. Okay, they're not rotating. And then the small contact area is also subject to wear. So you have to be very careful to handle the plate micrometer so it won't break. Okay. Point micrometer looks like this, and it's also with digital readout. They're made with a pointed anvil and then the spindle to measure the web thickness of a drill, small keyways or grooves, okay? V anvil micrometer, see the end of your anvil looks like a little V, your spindle, and here we also have a digital readout for accuracy. The next one is a V anvil micrometer, same thing, this V is a little bit different, from the previous example, they're used for measuring cutting tool, such as your tops, your reamers, and end mills. And the next one is a go, no go gauge that we use for rifle. So here you have a two, okay, two spindle, two anvils, and two barrels, and two thin balls right there. One for go and one for no go. So a limit micrometer, we use it. Uh, by setting the upper again the lower limits okay next one is your can seam so here 
a little bit different micrometer. Many of the canned goods in your home have been inspected with a can C micrometer. Okay, so everything that you your food products, your bean cans, or all of that in the cans is completely inspected by using this little instrument called can C micrometer. So it measures the width the height and then the depth of your can seams and the next one is your hop micrometer it looks like this and it's particularly useful for checking your web thickness so while work is checked by machining so it's narrow frame definitely permitted to enter holes okay here um, as small as three by four inch in diameter so where do we use the hub micrometer we use it k2 Enter holes and is available in sizes up to five inches. And the next one is your tube micrometer. Here we have a digital readout of this type. Then you have several micrometers special adapted for measuring tubing. So the one shown here has a pin handle. Okay, and this is your spindle. So we have like a different shape, okay, attached to your frame. Okay, sometimes we have a digital readout right there. So if you pay attention, what's your envelope shape and what's your spindle shape, then you can be able to identify what type of micrometer that is, okay? All right, the next one is bench micrometer. That should be 10. So anyway, so the bench micrometer is by far the most reliable micrometer. It's also expensive. So measuring to 10 of a mil, so we can go all the way to 0 0.0001 inches. So it's discrimination right there is directly in 10 mil. Okay, so no vernier is required. You can just use straight uh, out of this bench micrometer. It's definitely give you greater reliability. Okay, why? Because it's so stable. Okay, stable totally. We're not doing with the hands completely standing on its own stand. Also, you have a very, very large diameter. Okay, thimble. See how huge that is? Anyways, this is called bench micrometer because it definitely is standing on its own. All right, so that's it for your chapter seven.